Dear God, I just thank you for this uh, time we can come together and again look at uh, the reliability of your scripture and, uh, Lord, how we can use that as a foundation for sharing our faith. Uh, we thank you for uh, your love for us and the way that you've displayed your glory in so many ways. Just bless this time that we have together in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, this is our last lesson in the series. Uh, just to review our course objectives we talked about in the past, uh, one of those was to strengthen our faith related to different topics. And we've been going through those. Last week, we looked at the reliability of Scripture. I'm going to uh, supplement some of that today. We didn't quite get through all that material that I intended. Uh, and then we're going to look at uh, another reason for uh, studying apologetics and worldviews is to be able to equip us to share our faith, uh, to equip Christians to be able to, to contend for our faith, and also to share our faith uh, by way of a defense. And so relative to the topics we've been looking at, uh, we've looked at the introduction of truth or epistemology, the existence of God, the goodness of God, the identity of Jesus, the reliability of Scripture. Last week we looked at the canon, the translation of the Bible, and then textual criticism. And today I'm going to take a little bit of time to look at uh, textual apologetics. So what do we mean by textual apologetics? Well, as, as I think most of you all know, if you've interfaced with, with very many people, there are critics out there uh, that claim the Bible is full of errors. And so how do we respond to that? Uh, one of the first typical questions is I, I normally ask, well, what exactly, what error are you talking about? Uh, many times people really don't have anything definitive to respond. But what we're going to look at is, is just, I'm going to just touch the surface here. We could spend at least six weeks on this topic of uh, looking at some of the critics uh, and criticism sometimes of people that claim there are contradictions in Scripture and try to give a framework for how we go about looking at that issue. And so one of the things that we need to always keep in mind is making sure that we have a proper perspective about what we're reading. Um, a lot of times when people uh, claim that there is an error, the problem is they're looking at something from the wrong perspective. I'll try to give you uh, at least one example of that. Uh, so that's something we need to be thinking about when we're talking to people. Uh, the Bible was written in a certain, certain historical context, a certain cultural context, and so on. And so sometimes when you're reading things, people can take things out of, out of context and come up with meanings that, that the Scripture never attends and then claim that there's some type of error. We also need to recognize that there are certain literary techniques that the different authors use. There's different genres of literature and so on, and so all that needs to be factored into our consideration. Uh, so when we're looking at examples of perspective, I already mentioned a couple of these. We need to remember the historical perspective of the document, the cultural perspective. Uh, a lot of times that will give us a, a, a better understanding. Uh, the scientific perspective is just talking about an absolute frame of reference, a relative frame of reference uh, and so on. Uh, also, the literary context, especially with regard to the, to the genre of the literature. And then there's all kinds of different figures of speech that, that are used in Scripture. I've actually given you a whole list of uh, a few of those on the back of your handout just to give you a little bit of orientation to those. So that's also something we need to, to remember. Uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to uh, Mormon friends, of course, they believe that God is a, has a physical body with arms and fingers and so on. And, you know, there are scriptures that give amorphisms that talk about, uh, you know, God has, uh, uses things like God's strong arm and things of that nature that they try to allude to. You know, it also talks about uh, God like, like a, uh, uh, a mother hen that tries to gather people under their wings. And so they don't tend to... to go with those, but that they go to the others. So those are obviously figures of speech, uh, and so we need to keep that in mind. Remember the little example I gave you with the, the nine dots? How many people are here for that? A couple of people weren't. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the, the little exercise was to try to connect the four dots, or excuse me, the nine dots with, uh, with four st straight continuous lines, and uh, most people could not do that because... They kept trying to stay within the boundaries of the box, all right? Uh, but if you recognize you can actually come up with a solution with four lines outside of that, by going outside the box, it, it, I think it serves as a useful analogy. A lot of times people are have a certain perspective uh, 
that's preventing them from seeing a larger perspective that provides a way to understand and answer those questions. In fact, the example I gave you, I also, also showed you an example of how many lines? Three, Three lines, okay. Uh, so that's a real strong example. I've, I've used that uh, somewhat frequently sometimes when talking to people, I kind of walk them through that and it sort of, sometimes they have an epiphany. It's like, well, maybe I'm not looking at all the different perspectives here. Okay, so something to keep in mind. Uh, here's an example of of not having a proper perspective. Uh, here's a you know a familiar uh, passage in Joshua. Where it talks about how the moon uh, or, or the sun stood still, basically, uh, and also there's scriptures that talks about that in the heavens God has pinched a tent for the sun, and it comes out and comes and goes back and so on. Uh, and so we can we can also look at these these types of passages from a certain perspective. They're from the perspective of someone that's sitting on the Earth and observing the externalities of the of the galaxy and so on. So what, where could you run into some problems with that? I mean, here's a, a classic quote by Martin Luther, uh, who I think falls into this kind of blunder. He says, "People gave earshot." Uh, to this upstart astrol or gave ear to this upstart astrologer who strove to show, strove to show that the earth revolves not the heavens or the or the firmament the sun and the moon this fool Copernicus, Copernicus wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy but sacred scriptures tell us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth okay so so what's going what would you say relative to Martin Luther's quote there if you were talking to Martin Luther, how would you answer that? You may not, all right. Maybe unless you took him to a, 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 a um, took him to a, 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 a telescope or something and showed him, you know, the planets and things like that. Or, uh, but you see the problem there, okay? He's 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 making an argument from a relative perspective versus an absolute perspective. Okay, so sometimes we can do that with scripture. You can read into things. Uh, for example, if I if I were to toss this toss this uh, rope, remote control to to Charles here. Okay, you ready? So, uh, what what is the velocity of, of that object that I just threw to him? Would you guess an estimate? Five feet per second. Five feet per second, okay, approximately, something like that. Uh, if I'm standing outside, or if I'm in space and I'm watching the Earth spin around, what would be the velocity of that? It would be different, wouldn't it? Okay. If I was standing in the universe and I'm watching uh, our, our galaxy, or excuse me, our, our solar system go around the galaxy rotating, what would be the velocity? Okay, what if I'm standing outside of the universe and I'm watching our galaxy moving through the universe, a different velocity. Uh, so if I write that this object that I just threw to him was moving at five feet per second, that would be true relative to that reference frame, all right? But if I'm looking at another reference frame, that wouldn't be exact, it wouldn't be false, but it would not necessarily be the complete story, okay? And so it's a lot of times when we're looking at scripture sometimes, we try to enforce, or our critics try to enforce one specific frame of reference without recognizing that the scripture may be written from another perspective. Does that make sense? So that's how you can fall into some of these apparent contradictions as an example. So one of the examples that comes up a lot of times is we look at the, the Gospels and, the, and it, there's differences. There's differences in order and there's differences in detail. And so a lot of times critics uh, and some that say they're New Testament scholars say, well, this is an obvious error. Uh, they got it wrong. They really didn't know what they were talking about. Or someone later on has kind of embellished the narrative and added things, and they really didn't know what the truth was. And so, again, what we're going to look at a little bit today is how we can start coming up with some general guidelines for evaluating these supposed, con supposed contradictions. So what are some reasons for differences in the Gospels? Well, one is there's a difference in chronology. Most people don't recognize, the, the, most of the Gospels were not written as a chronological history of what happened, okay? Each of the authors had a specific purpose 
of why they were writing that gospel, and they wove these stories in the historical context in a structure to convey a larger story. I'll give you some examples to help explain that. So that's one thing. Uh, there's also a difference in focus. There's a difference of audience. There's a difference in content uh, related to the audience. Uh, there's difference in precision uh, of the writers. Uh, when I'm talking to somebody and I'm approximating uh, the number of people that were in an event, I might say, well, there were 100 people there. Maybe there's 102, okay? Would that be conveying a, a, an error? No, I'm just using an approximation to convey the information of how, relatively how many people are there, okay? So sometimes there are precision things. Uh, sometimes Paul would kind of paraphrase quotations from the Old Testament. If you go back and look at the actual Hebrew, sometimes he would, he would make little paraphrases of that. He's still conveying the same message. It's still scripture, but there's a difference. That doesn't mean it's an error, okay? Uh, and then there can be differences in details. I'll give you three examples of these. There are a lot more... Uh, but th these were more literary devices that were used by the, the authors, and partly because you have to recognize when they would write scrolls or parchments, these things came in fixed sizes or dimensions. So if I'm going to, I've got so much space to write a narrative, I may have to leave out some details uh, in order to get it all to fit on a certain size. Does that make sense? So, so that can also have a constraint on the way that the, the writers of the, of the Gospels compose things. So we'll look at three examples of that omission, compression, and representation that uh, critics would say, well, that's obvious. They, they, didn't, they, they were making mistakes or errors. Well, no, they were literary structures they were trying to employ uh, in order to, in some cases, fit the material in. Okay? So I think most people are familiar of the fact that the Gospels are, are different. Uh, normally, we have the Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, are called the synoptic gospels, uh, that they're kind of all seeing the same uh, material, basically. Uh, as you can see here, they're, they're almost uh, all very complementary. They contain a lot of the same material. There's very little uniqueness, like Mark is, 95% of Mark is shared in Matthew and Luke and so on. So they're all kind of giving the same perspective, but as we'll see, they have different focuses, nonetheless, in that perspective. Uh, I, the, the perspective is typically historical. They focus more on the Galilean mission uh, and ministry of Christ. They're, they tend to cover more of the public discourses, the parables, and they tend to emphasize the things that Jesus did, all right, his practices. John's gospel, as we know, came later on. Uh, it, was, it was supplementary. 92% of, of John is unique relative to the other Gospels. It has a more theological perspective. Its focus is more on the Judean ministry. Uh, it, it includes a lot of the private discourse uh, that Jesus related to the disciples. And in this case, a lot of the allegories that Jesus uses are mentioned, and the focus here is not so much on the practice of Christ, but the person of Christ. So you see uh, right off the bat that looking at these broad categories, that the different Gospels had different missions or are perspectives. And you may have seen this diagram before. This kind of shows you the relationship, the commonality of some of the narrative in the different Gospels, uh, at least the Synoptic Gospels. So the sort of magenta color is material that's shared by all three of those Gospels. And then you see those materials shared by Mark and, and Matthew, or Mark and Luke, and then Luke and Matthew. And you can kind of see some of the overlap of those. And most scholars think that Mark was probably written first, that Matthew and Luke used that some of their source material then added to that. We know Luke talked about he was went and interviewed a lot of people and tried to pull all that material together and so on. Okay. And one of the reasons we also think uh, that Mark was probably the first gospel is a quote by uh, uh, Papabus, who's a bishop of uh, Herpolis, who said, John, the elder, being a, a, the... Um, the Apostle John, the elder, used to say about this, Mark had been the interpreter or translator for Peter, so Mark's gospel is really Peter's gospel in essence. Okay, And he wrote down as much as Peter told him in the sayings and deeds of Christ accurately, but not in order. So right off the bat, you had this uh, statement that the, the material was not necessarily written in strict chronological order. 
Why is that? Because, again, each of the Gospels had a different focus. Mark was pr written primarily to the Roman audience. He had sort of a pragmatic focus, and in this case, Jesus was being displayed as the servant, okay, which was unique, uh, a, a, a unique type of display relative to looking at a Roman audience. He was, he was introducing the concept of God as a servant in this case. Matthew, we know, is written primarily to the Jewish audience. His focus was had a religious focus, and he was presenting Jesus as the Messiah. That was the, that was the mission there. Luke was written to a Greek audience. Uh, it's fascinating. Luke constantly is talking about the temple, and it, I could take some time to de de uh, deconstruct that. One of the points is in Luke's gospel, you see Jesus always reaching out to the disenfranchised people. Right, the marginal folks, uh, and basically the concept that, that God, which was in the temple, is now basically released to the world. Okay? Uh, hence, when we get into uh, in Acts, where, where Luke talks about you know, Jesus again giving the, the um, admonition to the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. They had the Holy Spirit, and then to be his witnesses from uh, Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uh, other parts of most of the world, the centrality obviously starting at the temple. And then John is written to a universal audience. The focus here is, is more philosophical. And here, uh, Christ is presented as the perfect God. So we have each one of these authors the Holy Spirit used to give a different perspective or facet uh, of our understanding of Christ. So let me get uh, a few examples of, of how these different authors tackle things. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, there is this sort of introductory uh, verse in Matthew 4.23. So Matthew's trying to present a narrative here. He talks about how Jesus went through Galilee teaching in the synagogues and preaching the good news and healing every disease. He sets the stage, then he goes through Matthew 5-7. through seven examples of Jesus teaching and preaching. So he, he said this is what he did. Then he takes three chapters to basically give examples of that. Then in Matthew 8 through 9, he goes and pulls together and shows all the miracles. So this is all dovetailed back to that uh, verse, uh, verse 20, 423, where he's given the context of what he's trying to communicate. So the point he's trying to communicate, Jesus came teaching and preaching, and he also came healing uh, various diseases and sicknesses. Right? So you see a, a structure, just w one little example of a structure in the book, it's not just a chronology, he's, he's using narrative to set up a framework to try to present not only the, the content that's in the scripture, but other overlying messages that the Holy Spirit is communicating. Uh, another example is in the Gospel of Mark. One of the questions people would ask uh, looking at a Roman audience. I mean, the Romans killed Jesus. Why, why, why did they want to kill Jesus? Or why was there so much opposition to Jesus? If you look in chapters 2 and 3, he sets and he basically makes this argument. Uh, he, he goes through and goes through several miracles that Jesus performed. And then each case, when the miracles performed, he gives the response of the, the religious leaders. So right off the bat, Jesus hears heals a paralytic, and then you can see the response uh, of the Pharisees. You know, why does Philip fellow talk like this? He's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Then Jesus calls Levi, and then right after that, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus uh, is uh, talks about fasting, and then uh, they're not fasting. Remember, they, they accused Jesus, why aren't you fasting? So you get into that issue. Remember when Jesus is going through the grain fields and they glean some uh, kernels of, of wheat on, on the Sabbath. And again, the, the, you have the Pharisees and them attacking Jesus for that. They remember when he was healing in the Sabbath. Same thing. So you have this narrative. My point is <clears throat> these Gospels were not just written as someone writing down observations. They were all pre-structured. The Gospel writers had a certain theme that they are writing and they were making arguments embedded in the larger narrative. And so you step back and get that perspective. You can all see, see a, a overlying message that the, the gospel writers are making. Why I'm making this, this discussion the context of potential errors, a lot of times people then jump on 
verses and they say, well, this is out of order, this other uh, gospel or something. Well, that's not the purpose, okay? They're, they're, they have the wrong perspective like I just talked about. And then fascinating, at the very end, after all these things have happened, Mark kind of closes the narrative in chapter 3, and it says, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So Mark has laid out an explanation of how this was happening. Okay? Does everybody understand that? So if we continue on with Mark, then he goes through uh, a whole series of parables about hearing. All these different uh, verses here, you can see the focus is on hearing things, hearing things, hearing things. And immediately, then he transitions into chapter 5 with Jesus having all these discourses. All right, So he, he's saying, look, you need to listen, and then this is what you need to listen to. All those are embedded in the structure of these, of these uh, Gospels. Uh, if you look in the order of accounts in Luke, it's very fascinating. Luke had a particular focus on Jerusalem and the temple. There's 31 times in Luke's gospel something is focusing on the temple. He starts out his gospel, remember, after he goes through uh, talking about the descendants uh, or the uh, predecessors to Jesus. Remember, he starts out, uh, what, what's the central story that starts out in Luke? Anybody remember? Right, and then when they take, where do they take Jesus to at the very beginning of the book? The temple, remember? They take him to the temple to get uh, circumcised and everything. And then they remember the story, he goes back to the temple as a child. All these stories are interwoven uh, about the temple, okay? It's just throughout the entire narrative. At the very end is the only narrative we're told that the, the curtain is rent in the temple. Uh, and the very last verse in Luke, it says, and they stay continually at the temple praising God. So the whole gospel of Luke is bookend in the temple. And wh where does Acts, uh, when the church gets started, where does, where does the church start in the book of Acts? It starts in the temple. They're meeting in the temple, remember? So he has this narrative, of all, he's interwoven all these things about the temple. And the reason I bring that up is you're, I'm setting the context for explaining what a lot of times people point out as a quote-unquote error in Scripture. And if you don't understand this context, you're not going to understand why Luke does something uh, in just a second here. So if we look at the genealogies of Jesus, we know we have two different genealogies that they're different. And Matthew, Matthew's writing to who did I say? He's writing to the Jews. So he lays out a genealogy, okay, with Joseph, all right, through Abraham, and David, right? Because he's, he's weaving in a Jewish gene genealogy. When you go to Luke, though, Luke remembers being written to the Greeks, and he's trying to portray Jesus as the son of man, all, all men. Jesus traces Mary all the way back to who? To Adam, okay? Adam is the first man. Adam has a connection to all of humanity. So Luke is making an argument that Jesus has a connection to everyone. He's for everyone, okay? So Matthew makes this, the way, the reason his genealogy is set that way is because he's trying to enforce uh, or make a certain point. Luke, in this case, goes through his genealogy, and the genealogy then immediately, Luke's gospel essentially begins with Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, there's a profound theological reason why Luke is doing this, okay? Why, why do you think he might be doing that? Any speculation? Exactly. That's exactly what he's doing, okay? So, if you look at the temptation of Jesus, John does not include that narrative. Mark doesn't include details. Matthew, when he gives the three temptations, he has... The bread, the temple, and the kingdoms. Those are the order that he gives. Okay? Now, when Luke gives the temptations, he switches the order. Okay? And he puts the temple last. Okay? So people say, well, obviously that's an error. They're, they don't have the same, same order. Okay? So Luke has the temple last. Why does he have the temple last? Because he's been emphasizing the temple. The temple's this whole interwoven thing. So he, he switches the order of the temptations to finish up with the temple. He also does this relative to getting back to those 
three temptations, right? So Luke lists the temple last for emphasis, and he lists the genealogy right before to set this connection up with Adam, okay? So in, in Luke's gospel, you have the temptation of Christ is the bread, the kingdoms, and then the temple. If you go back into Genesis, what do we see? The temptation was something was good for food, which is a corollary to bread, pleasing to the eye. Remember, Satan took uh, Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms that he could possess. Okay. And then the temple, desirable for gaining wisdom or to making her like God. So what, what Luke is doing is saying the second Adam has now come. He has gone through the same temptations that the first Adam did. Okay. First Adam and Eve, and Jesus overcame them. All right? And where does Paul pick up on this? You go over in Romans, he makes this direct comparison between Jesus as the first Adam and so on. Okay? So Luke is writing his narrative to, to present or make certain arguments. Okay? And a lot of times we, don't, we, we miss those. And so somebody that says, well, you have an error here because... Uh, in one gospel, you've got this order. In this other gospel, there's a different order. The reason there's a different order, again, these are not written chronologically or even sequentially. They're written from a narrative perspective where the writers are trying to make an argument. Okay, They're trying to convey a message. And the message in this case is that Jesus is the Son of Man. He is the second Adam. He's come to basically redeem the whole world. Okay, Does that make sense? Okay, so we see this also this connection with Adam when you go over in First John, looking at us, right? The, the temptations of the world, the, they have these same three temptations in, in, embedded in there. And once again, we know in Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus was tempted in all these ways, yet without sin. So now we have a great high priest, okay? Great high priest, crawling back to the temple, okay? So it all gets tied together. And a lot of times... There's all these interwoven themes like that in Scripture that are there, these, these treasures uh, that, that we miss because we're trying to read things from a, a faulty perspective. And a lot of times critics fall into the same problem. Okay? They don't see the glory of God in the Scripture, and they don't see it. They're just blind. That's like Paul talks about in Corinthians. The, the, the God of this world has blinded them for seeing the glory of God not only in the universe, not only in Christ, but in the scripture itself, the way it's written and the and messages that are there, the treasures that we can mine out if we're looking for them. So some other examples sometimes you encounter uh, where people say, well, this is obviously uh, a contradiction because there's differences, okay? Uh, this is an example of a mission. So the Gospel of John never mentions Jesus' agony in the garden or the trial before Sanhedrin. So you have these critics say, well, see, God, John doesn't even talk about that, uh, and so it didn't happen. That's the argument, okay? So liberal scholars have claimed none of these happened. Uh, how would we respond to that? Well, again, I, as I already mentioned, when you have these standard scroll links, there's only so much link that you have to put material in. John already knew that the other Gospels were out there. This material had already been relayed. Uh, and so it's likely he didn't include it because he knew this was already well known. Uh, then, but he did mention two other related items in his gospel that, that tied directly back to those arguments. So that's just one example when sometimes people say, well, it's not here and it is here, so there must be a contradiction. Right? Again, you're just different perspectives are looking at the same event. Uh, another example is the concept of compression. Uh, Again, this was a literary technique of the first century. The people, the way would they would write, would compress uh, items into a, a single narrative. So we have the, the parable of the fig tree. Uh, in Mark, it says the fig tree was cursed. Remember, Jesus was going to the temple. He saw, he saw the, the fig tree. He cursed it. They went to the temple on the way back. They, they looked at the, the disciples, saw the, the tree, and, and what had happened to it. It died. It withered. Okay, so we had this temporal sequence. <clears throat> in Matthew, it says Jesus cleansed the temple, and then the fig tree being cursed and withers <clears throat> occurs in one event. It's not a broken event by going to the temple, coming back, and cursing the tree. So a lot of times people say, well, that's obvious. shows the Bible has errors in it. Okay, well, again, this is just a literary 
example of compression. Uh, by that I mean the author compress two sequential things into one event to convey the same message, okay? So a difference like that is not an error, it's just a different way of presenting the same information. Does that make sense? Again, because we're not looking necessarily, the writer's not focused on a scientific precision. The, 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 the Bible contains science, but it's not a scientific document. It's a narrative the Holy Spirit has written to convey truth, okay? And that's not error, it's just a different narrative way to present the same thing. Does everybody see that? So I hope you hope you not say that that's an error in Scripture, okay? It's not. Uh, another example is a concept of representation. A lot of times people will throw this out. Oh, this is an obvious uh, contradiction between the Gospels. So remember the, the centurion's sixth slave, right? Uh, the centurion comes, uh, says, I, I have a slave that's been with me. He's sick. Jesus uh, says, go your way, your, your, your slave has been healed. And he turns to the disciples and says, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. Uh, so in Matthew's gospel, it says that it, the centurion himself came and made the presentation. In Luke's gospel, it says the centurion friends came and made the request. Okay, so is this a contradiction or not? Seems like it. Okay, unless you understand the cultural narrative structure of what's going on here. For, for if, if the president sends an ambassador to a foreign country, that ambassador, in effect, is representing the president, okay? You could say the president has, has come to me to give me this information, right? The same thing is happening here. So if, if the centurion sends an emissary, uh, uh, an emissary f from him to make a request, it's the same thing as the centurion is, is making the request. So, so that's what's going on here relative to this example of compression. Uh, you have another example of compression in James and John's request. So in John's gospel, it has James and John coming up and making a request for what? So can we sit on your right and left hand? And Jesus says, it's not for me to decide, it's for Father to decide. And the other disciples got a little ticked off about that, if you recall. All right. In Matthew's gospel, it says... Their mother came and made the request, okay? So, again, it's probably, as far as, depending on your precisional perspective, it's probably true that the mother came, but the mother was making the request, again, on behalf of, of, of uh, James and John. The same concept, very similar to what we've looked at, okay? Which also gives a, a, a more enriched perspective on these two guys, right? They didn't have the courage to go. They get their mom to go ask Jesus for this, okay? Uh, and so it's kind of fascinating uh, when you look at that. Maybe, I guess John was trying to, to, since he's writing that, he was trying to, like, confess it up. Yes, I, actually, we did. It wasn't our mom. I mean, we we're the ones behind this, okay? So uh, anyway, so do you, do you see some examples where a lot of times people will try to take what they say are contradictions in scripture and it's just underlying it really is, is a misunderstanding of perspective of the narrative that you're looking at now i've just barely scratched the surface on this concept i just wanted to introduce it to you so uh when you're running to people you keep that in mind the easiest way i can try to remember that is that nine dot analogy it's a very strong analogy to keep reminding yourself that that things are not always as they seem uh, unfortunately, we don't, we, again, we could, we could take six weeks walking through a, a whole series of these. There's really two good books out there that if you really want to dive into this. Uh, the book by When Critics Ask by Gissler and, and How is about that thick. It covers just about every contradiction that people have ever come up with in Scripture. Uh, it's really good. And then by John Halley, The Alleged Discrepancies of the Bible. Both of those are really good. Can I just make a recommendation? Yes, buddy. Yes, that's another good book. And it goes through your little bigger point of this about people, most of the time, people who are eating it don't actually have a basis for their own argument. Right. Rather than being a defense of the reality of these things, it's how to engage the conversation with those people who would expose them with absence of their own foundation. It's a really good book. Yeah, it's a great book. In fact, I was, I was planning on discussing that today, but we ran out of time, so I'm going to go and do a one-shot on that book at some point in the future. So, did you hear that? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on doing a one-shot on that book sometime in the future. Okay. All right. Okay, so any questions on that?
Yes. Do you think it's crucial for Christians to engage a debate on biblical difficulties and their issues and so forth with non-believers? N not really. I mean, if you remember uh, when I, I don't, I don't think you're here for that, but I'm going to go over that with the review. Uh, when you're when you're engaging with people, I, I I try to stay with what their worldview framework is. As uh, Buddy alluded to, that this book on tactics does a good job of that, and you just dialogue with questions, and you basically, I mean, Francis Schaeffer used this this uh, apologetic for years. Uh, in essence, you start where where a person is, you identify what their presuppositions are, and then you try to help them see that their presuppositions or their beliefs. Uh, are inconsistent with the way they're living and then put them in that tension and then try to show that Christianity provides a coherent way to live uh, and then let the Holy Spirit work in that environment, basically. So, so even, even in that, if the unbeliever is wanting to talk about the difficulties in the Bible, mm -hmm. should you even engage that discussion? Well, I think, I, th I, I, I can't say unilaterally yes or no. I think you need to be somewhat sense of the leadership of the Holy Spirit in that uh, what I'm trying to say is and it's, uh, it depends on where that person's sincere are they really looking for an answer to that question or are they are they trying to use that as a weapon to attack you with uh, and if it's a latter I think there are other tactics you can use going back to the title of that book you can ask them questions to try to uh, kind of open up where they are for example so so you, you, you think that there's a problem here. Um, why do you think that? And uh, do you think you have complete knowledge that you understand all the dynamics of this literature? I mean, this is a literary document that's got written in cultural historical context. And if you can show them just a, a few examples to say, here's an example that you brought up. Here's a resolution of that. Um, it's quite, do, do you accept the possibility there could be other resolutions to these other questions? Is that really the issue that you're dealing with here? If I, if I could come up and answer every, every, uh, every question that you have, would you then accept Christ? I mean, it just get to the bottom line, right? And if they say no, then it say, well, then, then this is really not the issue for you, okay? This is just a straw man that you're throwing out there, a red herring to try to divert from what the real issue is. So let's talk about what is the real issue? What is your opposition? It's not this, because we've disproven that. So really, what is the issue that's, that's, that's holding you back? Is it it's your, your will, that you just don't want to accept the, the possibility that there is a God and that, that you have to basically be responsible to that person? I mean, that's fine if that's your perspective, but let's just be honest in our discussion so we understand where we're both coming from. So that's kind of how we'd start that, that discussion. So does that make sense? Right. That you're like, yeah, I get it. Like, I, I thought that too. Well, it's like I've said in the past. Anytime a critic comes up and starts asking you to defend your faith, you have to recognize the questions that they're asking. Their presuppositional background has to be able to answer the same questions. Uh, and again, that's one of the points that, that is made in the book Tactic, Tactics. Right. And so being able to remain what is on top of that aspect, but again, going back to the detail, to be able to engage through the questioning and helping them to fine tune the absence of their own truth. You know, saying, no, there is an inconsistency. They don't like to profess a lot of things they don't actually believe in. And uh, so I think that it's important to be engaging. It may not always go right as favorable as, you know, inerrancy, which is what kind of Picard is saying. But I think it's important just to kind of have some good questions. Yeah, I think that's the important thing is just to start a dialogue. Again, we're not here to, to win an argument. We're, we're here to uh, provide an opening for the Holy Spirit to use 
to, to reach those people. Did you have a follow-up, Dave? Yeah, I guess I, I was interested in your opinion because I've heard a sidestep to that issue just being that just basically making the claim that in order to become a Christian, if you're talking with somebody that's not a believer, the ultimate would be for them to become a believer. Right. And they wouldn't have to swallow inspiration and inerrancy to do that. No, no, I, 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 I no. get straight to the resurrection and just say that's really an in-house discussion. Yeah. We can you know. talk about that later. Right. When you think about the resurrection. Well, as I'll show here in a second, uh, I, when I laid out the beginning of class, I kind of laid out our apologetic as a process and that there are steps along the way. You don't jump to step four with an atheist, okay? You have to first start with uh, an argument of the, of the existence of God, all right? And then typically I would have to then move to whether God is good or not, okay? Then I'd have to move to was, was Christ real and did he rise from the dead? And then I would get into the reliability of scripture issues, okay? So there's that progression. But sometimes people will try to jump over those, but you need, need to kind of move them back to try to make sure that we're moving in the, the proper perspective. It, does that help? Okay, so I, as I promised, uh, you would get a final exam. So I uh, hope you have your seat belts on because we're going to run through the last six weeks in 30, 25 minutes. So, um, so if you recall, uh, the beginning of the class, we had a couple of basic definitions. Uh, one was, how do we know something to be true? What was the term for that? Epistemology. Okay. Uh, then we talked about how do we show something to be true or offer a defense. That's apologetics. Okay. And so we, I gave you two needs for apologetics. Why, why do we need apologetics? There were two reasons. Okay. We need apologetics for a internal. internal witness. Why is that? Okay, yeah, we get people coming up with funny doctrines and churches and stuff, and so we need to be able to instruct people. Uh, we also need uh, an external witness, obviously. We, we live in a very secular culture uh, with... Uh, people that don't not only do not accept our faith, but are in opposition, antagonistic to it. The the the, uh, the rise of the uh, anti-theist, for example. So we also I gave you a quick review of history, uh, like 2,000 years in a couple of slides. So we, we had this concept of the modern period, which really I think influences a lot of our current culture. The fact that truth is divided into basically two realms. This is a concept that Francis Schaeffer came up with years ago, that in the upper story you have humanities, subjective truth, freedom, and so on. And the bottom story you have what we can objectively look at, the sciences. Uh, and then the Enlightenment came along and said, really, the only thing that we, we have is the mind. Uh, and so we had naturalism that arose that denied the reality and essence of the humanities, which ultimately leads to nihilism that kind of denies the, the meaning of anything. Uh, and we talked about that man really couldn't live in that dichotomous universe, that at least in the lower story. So there were attempts to get up to the upper story to try to derive meaning, even though they felt like there was none. One of those approaches was to use the heart. We talked about uh, transcendentalism, uh, folks like Emerson and Thoreau, and then romanticism with some of the poets uh, as attempts to drive a, a meaning to life in the midst of sort of a mechanistic universe. And then ultimately those projects kind of failed, and so we then looked at another approach, which, which was to use the will, just to will myself into believing something which was kind of the, the framework for existentialism. We talked briefly about some of the different existentialisms uh, or existentialists and the fact that there's also really a Christian existentialism as well. Uh, or there are those that, that uh, believe and act as Christian existentialists. Uh, and then we talked about we're kind of still stuck in that, that dynamic, although we've moved somewhat into sort of the postmodern period, although some people have would argue that this is kind of already past, but this concept that truth as an absolute is really an illusion, that none of us can know any truth at all. Uh, and then so, again, we have this concept of scientific naturalism that's really all that we can really believe, but we need something to hold on to to give our lives meaning. So what we have done 
is we've gone back and taken historical documents and somehow extracted pieces out of there and we hold on to those to use those to give our life meaning. And so I've given examples of those types of narratives, science, the law, we talked a little bit about the Constitution, how the Constitution is now used and interpreted either what the authors intentionally meant or what we want to make it to create our, our own uh, lives, so to speak. There are people in history that we kind of uh, elevate and lock on to. Uh, just stories as, as a narrative, you see a lot of people use as a, a way to give their life meaning. Uh, and, and then even the Bible sometimes will yank out pieces. We have sort of the new orthodoxy uh, or, again, some of the Christian existentialists that would do that. So that was kind of a, a real you know, like thumbnail sketch through several thousand years of history, the point being we, we have all these different disparate views out there or, or worldviews. And so then we came up with uh, a definition here set of presuppositions or assumptions which we hold consciously or subconsciously about the basic makeup of a world uh, that govern the way we live. And what was that? That was a, that's a worldview. We all have a worldview, whether we're willing to accept that or not. <clears throat> we said all worldviews must answer four basic questions. Who am I? Okay. Why is the world in such a mess? And I found that's a pretty effective introductory question to ask people who are saying, why do you think the world's in such a mess today? Okay. Most people, will, t most people in our culture today I run into, at least in the university, will, would assent to the fact that the world's in a mess. Okay. Now, a lot of people may say it's religion, it's the Republicans, it's the Democrats, it's uh, whatever, uh, but at least it's a place to start a discussion. Uh, why do I feel so alone in the universe? <clears throat> uh, that's an interesting quote that goes back to that movie Contact that was based on a book by uh, Carl Sagan, uh, and he kind of uses that in, in that book. And then what is the solution ultimately? And we all have different solutions to the issue, and that gives us a place to start a discussion. <clears throat> so th again, this gets into the point I was making, Dave, uh, about this process of apologetics that you really have, <clears throat> in essence, I think, three groups out there. You have atheists, you have agnostics, and you have anti-theists. And anti-theism uh, has kind of arisen today, but it's almost starting to wane if, you, if you're really uh, up on the, the current commercial dynamic. In fact, a lot of the atheist communities actually push back against the, against the anti-theist because they're kind of giving atheism a bad name from their perspective. Um, but it's, in my sense, you, you almost have to have someone that's at least open to the possibility that there's some additional truth out there to start your apologetic dynamic. Normally, what we talked about is first we want to ex try to convert them from agnosticism to theism, and the focus there we, we talked about was what? The argument, the existence of God, does God exist? Then move them from theism to monotheism or a personal God. The, the main problem that most people have there is the issue of, of suffering and evil. So how do we address that to give a bridge into a concept of a, of a, a loving God? So we, we, we talk about the goodness of God. Uh, and then we try to then present the divinity of Christ related to the resurrection and so on to move a person into Christianity. Uh, and then ultimately what I call Orthodox Christianity uh, ultimately gets into the dynamics of the scripture. Now, we can debate whether a person can really become a Christian um, if they deny scripture. Uh, that, that's another whole course we could, we could talk about. But, but this would be the progression, ultimately, though, we're looking for uh, truth. So that was kind of the apologetic roadmap that we laid out, I think, the, uh, the first lecture, and then uh, we've been moving through each of those arguments subsequently over the course of the, over the, course of the last couple of weeks. I gave this little structural model of, of truth and the way that truth and belief, there's a disconnect with most people, there's a truth gap, and that there's lots of different things factoring into what we actually believe as opposed to what is actually true. Uh, we have objective and de subjective criteria. We have our, mar our minds and our hearts involved, but ultimately our will is kind of operative as well. And at some point we have to make 
some infusion of faith into the constructs that we've received to make a, a, a decision for belief. Uh, and as a consequence, we looked at five forms of apologetics, different ways to engage someone based on where they are. And again, this has to be kind of set up, as Buddy was talking about, by dialoguing with people through questions so you can kind of understand where they are. So one of the first things we looked at is was proof. We're using deductive uh, apologetics. Uh, we looked at defense or classical evidential apologetics. We looked at refutation. Uh, or appealing to people's intuition or conscience a as a basis uh, for an apologetic. And then f we also looked at persuasion uh, based on experience, sharing your personal experience is a persuasive way uh, to make a contact. And then finally, uh, ultimately, we, we got to the concept of invitation and using scripture, uh, not necessarily to argue out of scripture, but for example, to give a person the Gospel of John and say, here, read this story, uh, this book, and come back and let me know what you think about the person that's talked about in here. And ultimately, the Holy Spirit has to open that person's heart so they can see the glory of God in Christ in, in the Scripture. All right? That's what Paul talks about over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, about that the, the God of this world has blinded people from seeing the glory of God. Uh, and so we we can use, though, God's word in order to use that as an apologetic, okay? Okay, so we, we then went through looking at the existence of God. We looked at general revelation, uh, the fact that God's natural attributes are revealed. Uh, we looked at two different evidential ways, or, or two different ways to do that. The first was what? Cosmological, or cause and effect. That's the latter is probably the easiest way to... And this other is another uh, a, a hard Greek one. What's you may remember that teleological, okay, or the design argument. Uh, then we looked at God's moral attributes. We looked at ethical evidence. Why is there uh, good and evil? Uh, kind of relates to that, or the fact that we all have this moral, we all have this sense of right and wrong. And then we finally looked at the metaphysical evidence. The fact that we, we do feel alone in the universe, why is that, okay? Uh, a fish doesn't feel out of place in water. Why do we feel out of place in this universe? This goes back to some of C.S. Lewis's arguments and so on. Uh, and then ultimately, we have to have an external source of information in order to um, be able to encounter God. And so we looked at ways that God has revealed himself, not through general revelation, but through special revelation, one through the Bible, uh, his, his written revelation, then through Christ, the Son of God, through physical incarnational revelation, and then ultimately through the Holy Spirit. So we have these three witnesses, this trinity of witnesses, ultimately that God has given us to understand who he is in, an, in a personal way. Uh, we then try to tackle the, the, the problem of good and evil, uh, or, or evil and suffering, and we looked at actually seven different problems. One was the metaphysical problem. Why does evil exist uh, from a philosophical standpoint? We talked about that evil doesn't really exist. In, an, in a constructive concept, it's the absence of something, the absence of good. Uh, we looked at the um, the, the uh, moral problem of evil. Uh, why are people evil, uh, and we looked at a logical defense that uh, Robbie Zacharias had given, and we also talked about the free will defense, part of the reason people are, are well, there's there's moral evil in the, in the universe and the world is because people have been given free will and they misuse that, and so that's an argument for that. We then looked at the physical problem of evil, and we had multiple reasons for that. I gave you 10 different composite reasons uh, using scripture as a basis. We looked at the biblical problem of evil, which has been the focus of, of folks like uh, uh, Harris and uh, Dawkins attacking really the fact that God is, uh, is a good God. Uh, we looked at the judicial problem of evil. How is evil ultimately going to be dealt with in the concept of hell? Uh, we looked at the experiential problem of suffering, the fact that Ultimately, we can talk about all this philosophy, but if you're, if you're talking to someone that's really struggling with whether to believe in God or not, it, it gets down to a personal issue, typically, of what they've gone through and, and how do you relate to that person, not 
as a, an object of debate, but how do you relert, relate to that person as a human being that's suffering? And so we talked about that. It's another whole dynamic. Uh, and then there's ultimately the sort of the epistemological problem of suffering. Why hasn't God given us more answers? Now, you could argue he has given us answers, but that's something that throughout Scripture we see people struggling with, that knowledge. Well, why don't we have a better answer to that? Uh, and then relative to the physical problem of, of, of uh, evil, I gave you several different uh, possible explanations, and we had scriptures that went along with each of those. There were 10 of those that we talked about. Uh, we talked about the biblical problem of evil quite a bit, again, getting back to the arguments of, of Dawkins and uh, Sam Harris. And part of that we saw was pe the... Critics are, are making errors in, in hermeneutics and exegesis of, of the, the verses that they're looking at. They've, they've neglected the scientific or grammatical or rhetorical, historical, prophetic context. There's a failure in their attacks typically to consider the progressive nature of revelation. The fact that God allowed things to happen in the Old Testament didn't mean he was sanctioning those. Uh, a failure to really to ultimately understand the nature of God's glory. We talked about the interrelationship between God's glory and God's love and how those are complementary, not contradictory. Uh, I think people really underestimate the nature of the hideous rebellion that we're in against a perfect God and what that really means and, and why God is justified uh, in basically a punishing that kind of rebellion. A refusal to recognize the, the rights of a sovereign God, that's really kind of ultimately what's going on here. People just don't want God to exist because they don't want to have to answer to anyone. They want to be like Satan, gods to their own selves. And a refusal to surrender the sovereignty, sovereign will of a loving God. God has sent them a way to have an eternal relationship with them. Ultimately, they're making a decision to walk away from that offer. Okay. So those were some of the, t the ways that we addressed that. On the judicial problem of evil, we looked at three issues, the reality and extern or eternality of hell, and both of those people struggle with. Uh, the latter one, you know, there's been people even in the, in the code evangelical community that have kind of questioned that, that, that would argue for annihilationism as opposed to an eternal punishment. Um, so we talked briefly about that. I gave you more supplemental literature, if you remember, on some of these topics. We looked at the exclusivity of Christianity, uh, a great argument by William Lane Craig, uh, one of the best I've seen about arguing for what about the person that's never heard. He would argue that person really doesn't exist. Uh, and then we talked, uh, or I gave you supplemental materials on the salvation of infants and children, the context of, of punishment for evil. Uh, and as I alluded to earlier, the, the experimental problem is really, uh, it's not really a philosophical issue, it's, it's a more personal issue. And so uh, it's fascinating, a lot of the people that, that I run into that struggle with, with their faith or with a belief in God, ultimately it, it, it a lot of times goes back to personal experiences they've had in this arena, that, that there's been some personal tragedy they've experienced and they just can't get uh, that resolved, and in many cases, it results in anger and bitterness, and the way that that typically works out is a decision, I'm just going to refuse to accept this God, or I'm going to look for ways to, to basically hold him uh, in account or for account of what, what I've experienced. Um, and then the epistemological problem, I always go back to this little puzzle exercise, because I think it Many times, if no one has ever seen this, it, it has an epiphanous reaction that, well, there are there may be other explanations out there that I can't uh, see or I haven't yet considered. So we then went into the issue of the divinity of Christ. We looked at three different views of Christ uh, and different arguments against his existence. One is that uh, Jesus never existed, so the reality of Jesus is a myth. The divinity of Jesus is a myth, or Jesus is real and divine. Those are basically the three three options, and we spent a little bit of time looking at each of those. Uh, we talked about some of the arguments against the, the resurrection, the first being the, I remember this one, the swoon theory. 
the conspiracy theory, the um, reburial theory, the fact that we put in the grave and that some they, they moved it and the disciples came to the first grave and it was gone. They just assumed that, uh, that he had been resurrected. Uh, the hallucination theory and the one that's probably more strongly advocated today is the myth theory. Uh, a good book that kind of covers some of those, again, is that Lee Strobel book, The Case for Christ, or, or uh, Gary Habermas has written probably the best book on that topic uh, out there, if you want to follow that up. We then kind of uh, went through the New Testament canon, and we defined what the word canon meant. It was sort of a measuring rod. Uh, there were five criteria we mentioned for how books ultimately made it into the, to the New Testament. Does anybody remember those? had to be accepted well well ultimately it had to be authentic okay authentic uh, there was another one that was authoritative and that normally meant it was uh, had been written by one of the apostles uh, possesses divine power was accepted by the church so there's your accepted and it was consistent with other scripture so we used so all those were all filters for how we could um, uh, know that we had the the, the the true canon of scripture. We talked briefly about translation of the Bible. We saw there were two major families of manuscripts. Uh, the first of those was the Byzantine, all right? That was the foundation for the King James Bible we talked about. Kind of went through why that argument was made because of the number of manuscripts, although they're much later. Uh, the, other, the other group of texts was the Alexandrian text, although there are fewer. Alexandrian text and the Byzantine text, they're all much earlier, and so you have these two arguments going on. Uh, most of the translations that we have today, like the ESV, the NIV, are all essentially more tied back to the Alexandrian text, although they're more sort of eclectic or critical text, which means they kind of encompassed all of the literature that's currently out there, and they've been synthesized, and, and we went through a little example of how some of that was done. Uh, we then talked about biblical variants, uh, and we have the concept of autographs with the original text, variants or differences between latter copies of the manuscripts. Uh, we talked about less than 2% of the known variants are viable and meaningful, and then we looked at some of those. We said that no known variant has overthrown any doctrine of Scripture, and uh, we have some confidence that we're able to recover some of the, orig or, or the original text through textual correction criticism and I kind of look through uh, we kind of look through some of the different tools that are used to do that uh, and then we, we also talked a little bit about the reliability of the New Testament I gave you actually 10 different evidences of these uh, first we have extensive testimony lots of manuscripts we have early testimony early copies of the manuscripts uh, we have eyewitness testimony as an, as an example, we have elaborate testimony. This is a fascinating one. I kind of briefly alluded to it, the fact that there are things written in one gospel that we kind of, we're not sure what is that, what is meant by that, but we find the explanation actually in another gospel, which, which gives some additional support or credence for the reliability of the documents. And there's probably over 80 examples of that. There's been a couple of books written on that topic that are very fascinating. Uh, we looked a lot at the embarrassing testimony, lots of things in the Gospels that you really wouldn't put in there if you were making up a myth, you know, to try to get people to um, go along with this. We looked at expected testimony, the prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament. We looked at enemy testimony, people that oppose Christ and yet, yet uh, ultimately then came over and gave affirming testimony, probably the classical example, that would be Paul. Uh, we looked at extra-biblical testimony, things in uh, other literature at the times that supported the reality, certainly of, of Christ, and then some of the uh, support for at least the perspective that the followers of Christ thought he had, had been resurrected. Uh, we looked at ex excavated testimony, evidence from archaeology, uh, and then we looked at um, expert testimony from literary scholars, C.S. Lewis being an example that we talked about. So it's a, it's a pretty overwhelming list, uh, a very strong list, I think, 
So when I, I get into like getting back to your question, Dave, about little about uh, little variations on contradictions of Scripture, typically I, I would have already gone back and tried to build a broader support for the global acceptance of Scripture before then getting into the to the weeds kind of on that. But again, as I've already talked about, I would have as a precursor to that this whole other process integrated or basically being fed by asking questions to folks to try to really understand what their issues are, okay? Uh, and then finally, uh, just reviewing what we went over today, the focus of the four Gospels. This is just a good thing to memorize, to kind of keep in your mind the different focus as you're reading these. Uh, Mark being written by the Rome, to the Romans with a pragmatic focus, portraying Jesus as Savior, excuse me, as a servant, rather, uh, Matthew, written to the Jewish audience with a religious focus with Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, Luke being written to the Greek audience uh, with sort of a temple focus, but also underlying that, really a, a focus on everybody, uh, that, that God had come to redeem all the marginal folks that had been thrown out, so to speak. Uh, and then Jesus as the perfect man, the Son of Man, and then finally... The Gospel of John, written to a universal audience with a more philosophical focus with Jesus as uh, the perfect God or the Son of God. And we have, hence, we have all the I am verses interwoven into the Gospel of John. Okay? So I'm sure everyone aced the exam, right? So um, well, that gives you a good outline, actually, I think, of some of the key issues related to an apologetic argument. Uh, uh, appreciate your all's faithfulness in uh, the, the course. Hopefully this was giving, uh, achieved our objectives, which was to strengthen your faith in uh, your own faith uh, and also maybe give you some uh, answers that you could provide to questions that you might encounter when you're sharing your faith, okay?